Lord be with you. And also with you. Welcome to worship on this glorious spring morning. I am grateful to be here, and I know that you must be too. Uh, I have a couple of announcements. First, if you haven't done so already, please tear off that top front section of your bulletin and put your name there. Be prepared to draw that in your offering plate uh, later in the worship service. Also, um, there is a there, there are a lot of announcements in your bulletin. I invite you to pay close attention to those and read them for yourself. But there is one that isn't there. That is, there is a congregational meeting, a special call meeting. On May 13th, uh, Mother's Day, immediately after the worship, it will be a short meeting, but the purpose is for us to give a full and final report regarding the theft and recovery of funds um, for uh, this process that's been ongoing since the middle of uh, 2016. So it's an important meeting. I hope you will be here. There will be no actions taken, but we want to provide information and be available uh, for questions. If you're able, please rise and join me in the call. The Lord is risen. Hallelujah. Yeah, let me see. 
God's promise. I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, I declare to you, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. taken out of the temple, the house of God in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords, his wives, and his concubines drank from them. They drank the wine and they praised the gods of gold and silver and bronze and iron and wood and stone. Immediately, the finger of a human hand appeared and began writing plaster of the wall of the royal palace. Next to the lampstands, the king was watching the hand as it wrote, and the king's face turned pale, and his thoughts terrified him. His limbs gave way, and his knees locked together. The king cried aloud to bring the enchanters the Chaladins, the diviners, and the king said to the wise men of Babylon, whoever can read the, this writing and tell me its interpretation shall be clothed in purple, have a chain of gold around his neck, and rank third in the kingdom. Then all the king's wise men came in, but they could not read the writing or tell the king the interpretation. Then the king, Bel Belshazzar, became greatly terrified, and his face turned pale, and his lords were perplexed. 
The queen, when she heard the discussion of the king and his lords, came into the banquet hall. She said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts terrify you or your face grow pale. There is a man in your kingdom who is endowed with a spirit of the holy gods. In the days of your father, he was found to have enlightenment, understanding, and wisdom like the wisdom of the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, made him chief of the magicians, enchanters, charlatans, diviners, and because of an excellent spirit, knowledge, and understanding to interpret dreams, explain riddles, and solve problems, were found in this David, Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give.
put you right there because you'll have our special spot. Down here, I bet. You can stand right there. Do you want to stand right beside me? Okay, this morning, this morning we uh, are talking about Daniel and he had writing on the wall that he was going to have to interpret. So I looked up what does writing on the wall really mean. One of the definitions I came across is something becomes clear. Figuring something out by reading between the lines, a realization that once made would be foolish to ignore. So that's what we're talking about today. Today we're talking about our children being our responsibility. <coughs> and it is all of our responsibility to know the children of the church. So next week is Youth Sunday. The middle school and the high school will be doing uh, some awesome things. And some of these children may even be involved. But, <laughs> but these are our younger children. We have a whole room downstairs in the nursery. So uh, maybe one day we'll get to do this to them too. Thank you, moms. You did not know. You did not know what we were doing. But all of the moms sent me information about their children, and I'm going to share that with you. Okay, let's start with Peyton. Peyton is a spunky and outgoing oldest sister of three. She loves the color purple, dance, art, climbing trees, and soccer. And I don't take her for shy. <laughs> and her sister, thank you, Peyton. Now, Embry, if you'll stand up. <coughs> Embry is calm and careful, the middle sister of three. She loves the color blue, dance, puzzles, movies, <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Emory. Millie. Millie, her name is Amelia, but she goes by Millie. She loves, uh, and here, here we call her Millie, too, and at home and at school, they call her Amelia. She loves gymnastics, her family, school, and talking about Jesus. She is happy, helpful, loving, and kind, with a little spunk. And Eli is not here today. Uh, Ellie. Here's Ellie. Ellie loves Legos. Oh, I'm sorry, that was Eli. Yeah. Ellie. <laughs> Ellie loves the color pink. She likes to do art and craft projects, dance, play piano, basketball, and softball. She loves to read and to play with her American girl, Welly Dog. Welly Wishers dogs, sorry. She loves pizza, cookies, ice cream, and wants to be a teacher when she grows up. There's lots of teachers out there. <laughs> And this is Jake. Jake and Ellie are brothers and sisters. Jake's favorite color is red. He likes to play sports. His favorite to play is basketball, and he likes to watch football. He loves to sing, play with his superheroes, and color and draw books. He loves cheesy rice and chocolate ice cream. And he wants to be a professional baseball player when he grows up. Way to go, Jake. <laughs> Lily. Lily is an amazing athlete. She's been a competitive swimmer since she was five. She water skis, plays soccer, rides horses, and will do her first triathlon this summer. She also has the most compassionate heart and has been an excellent share since she was a baby. This year, instead of gifts for her birthday, she asked her friends to bring food for the homeless animals and pets so that she could donate them. But we're so proud of her and love seeing how God is working in her life. Good job. Sam. Sam is the brother of George. So Sam likes working in the yard with his dad, everything that has to do with trucks. He loves playing sports, especially soccer. Sam also likes reading books and watching movies, and he's all about puppies. Okay, George. George is Sam's older brother. George loves soccer and playing Pokemon. Loves soccer and playing Pokemon. He likes riding bikes and playing outside with his brothers. George has a good sense of humor and makes us laugh all the time. Good job, George. Michaela. You can step out too so we can see you. Michaela. 
Kayla is quiet, outgoing, and loves to build and design Legos and drawings. Good deal. And I saw her reading there. Girl magazine back there, too. <coughs> Good job. Riley. Riley is Michaela's brother. Riley is energetic, opinionated, and always hungry. He loves to be a ninja. Okay, and we have some visitors. Would you tell me your name? Stand up so they can see you. You can stand up on this step. These two cute little things are Ivy's granddaughters. Reese and Reese and Lucy. Uh, these children all belong to us. So it is our job to make sure you get to know them, right? All right, ready? Let's say a prayer, and we'll go back to church. Oh, church. church family, and we look forward to getting to know each of them better. Let us work together in this day. Amen. Have been drinking wine from them. 
You have praised the gods of silver and gold, of bronze, iron, wood, and stone, which do not see or hear or know. But God, in whose power is your very breath, and to whom belong all your ways, you have not honored. So from his presence, the hand was sent, and this writing was inscribed, and this is the writing that was inscribed. Mene, Mene, Kekel, Uparsi. This is the interpretation of the matter. Mene, God has numbered the days of your kingdom and brought it to an end. Tekel, you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. Paris, your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command, and Daniel was clothed in purple. A chain of gold was put around his neck, and a proclamation was made concerning him that he should rank third in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, the Chaldean king, was killed, and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Today's story is an epic of intentional, deliberate, and willful human sinfulness and spectacular holy anger. Set the stage in chapter 5 of the book of Daniel. We find Daniel still in exile. There's a new king on the throne. His name is Belshazzar. But we've been leading up to this point from chapter 1, verse 2, where we were told that Nebuchadnezzar and his armies had come and sacked Jerusalem, utterly destroyed it, and taken from it the exiles like Daniel, young children who would grow up in a foreign land, and also the vessels of the temple. He had taken those vessels and he had dedicated them for the use of his own gods and his own temples in Babylon. I've had two bondage as I've been thinking about this phrase, writing on the wall. Some of you probably, yeah, I'm guessing, graduated from high school in the 70s, early 70s, mid-70s. You may remember the Paul Simon song, 1973. Coda from the Remember that one? You want to sing it with me? When I think back on all the stuff, we're going to use the word stuff. When I think back on all the stuff I learned in high school, it's a wonder I can think at all. <laughs> and my lack of education hasn't hurt me none. I can read the writing on the wall. Code of Repentance. Some of you know it. I know you. Where did this well-known phrase in Daniel 5 come from? There's a blasphemous banquet going on. And this disembodied hand is writing on the wall. There's an awkward halt to all of the proceedings in the face of some divine graffiti. Think about this party. Why is it of any concern to us some 25 centuries later? What's going on? What, what's, what is it? I think it can be summed up in one word. The word is blasphemy. Blasphemy. It's not a word that we use much anymore. It may not be a word that you quickly can think of the definition of. As a matter of fact, I'm going to use the word so often during this sermon that you might as well sort of get some hand motions to go with it. Right? Every time I say blasphemy, it just duh, right? And the, the notion is making fun of God, and that's a really bad idea to make fun of the one who controls the lightning, right? You duck, you take cover when someone is blaspheming. The dictionary definition is to act in, in an insulting and mocking and pronounced contempt toward God or something sacred. We don't talk about blasphemy much anymore. Why? Because we're modern people. 
and the world has become disenchanted. There's no more mystery or magic in the world. We Protestants have a hand in this, by the way. For Roman Catholics, when communion is served, there is this transubstantiation, there is this holy mystery that is there, and Calvin and his successors all said, hmm, we're going to get the magic out of faith and out of religion. So the water in here is not holy water. Right? It doesn't change substance. It's not a different thing. This is not a holy vessel. But by the Spirit of God and God's presence, what is ordinary and every day in life becomes holy. You can think of what's happening at this feast as something like an APSU frat party. And somehow they've gotten hold of these vessels. And we might use the word blasphemy if that happened, but I think it wouldn't have the same impact on us that it had for these Jewish people walking into this banquet and seeing what was happening with the holy vessels. These vessels that were from the temple in Jerusalem, if you read Leviticus, Numbers, Chronicles in your Bible, chapter after chapter after chapter, in which is described in intimate detail the divine instructions that were given as to how they were to be made and how they were to be used, and how they were to be inscribed with the holy name, the unpronounceable name of God, belonging to Yahweh. And here they are, not just in a drunken frat party, but being used in the worship of gods of gold and silver and wood and stone. It's more like these vessels had been taken and used by a bunch of Satanists to mock and ridicule the kind of worship that takes place in this place. When I use the word blasphemy, you might think that I'm talking about swearing, taking the name of God in vain. You might think of a pastor who has a sermon that he preaches that is somehow too light for the subject at hand that might somehow be blasphemy. And searching and thinking about how in the world to talk about this word that has sort of lost its power and its meaning in our world, one thing did come to. Here is a speech by the abolitionist Frederick Douglass in 1852. Gets it a little closer to our time. In which he reads the writing on the wall to a bunch of folks he calls the Belshazzars of the South. And to Douglass, the depravity and the callousness of the 19th century slave culture in the South was a form of blasphemy. These Belshazzars, whose fugitive slave law was making being a good Samaritan a criminal act, were, according to Douglas, willfully, deliberately, knowingly desecrating something that is sacred to Almighty God. Not vessels of gold and silver, not things like that, but things that were made with God's own hand, that God had made in God's own image to worship and serve God alone, these things were being used and misused and put to ugly and contemptible and blasphemous purpose. This sort of blasphemy doesn't occur today, of course. <coughs> right? Slavery and human trafficking is still with us. There is an estimate that 20.9% million people are trafficked in the world around them. 
that 14,000 people a year are trafficked within the U.S. And of course, we aren't the traffickers. And sometimes it's hard to see what connection that might have to us. But the abundance that we enjoy, the pure material abundance that we find everywhere, is uncomfortably close to a different kind of slavery. We read sporadically every once in a while about catastrophes in sweatshops in the developing world where people have been locked in to a place to manufacture goods for the developed world and a fire breaks out or some other uh, disaster and these folks are killed. It's estimated that 250 million children, ages 5 to 14, are forced to work below a subsistent wage in factories around the world. Places that make clothes that are sold in the U.S. I buy a $155, oh, they are way too expensive, sports jersey with the Cubs emblem. And the woman who sewed it <clears throat> makes 24 cents. Something similar holds true every time we visit the produce section in our grocery. Some planters treat their workers with dignity and care, others don't. It's estimated that ag workers, exempt from minimum wage laws and overtime laws, may make something like $11,000 a year. So I take this quick Douglas-inspired tour because my hunch is that 21st century blasphemy is more subtle, and more nuanced than that drunken party in ancient Babylon. But it still takes something that is sacred and holy to God, something that is made in his image and mocks God's righteous and just intention. Anywhere there is a banquet, a feast of abundance of this sort going on, and we are using vessels precious to God in thoughtless and irreverent ways, I think we ought to watch. Be careful. Brace yourself for some godly graffiti, some unwelcome and unappreciated and buzz-killing writing on the wall. We read this story this morning, it was deja vu all over again. Instead of a personal private dream of the king, this time the writing is very publicly there on the wall. It's just inscrutable. It can't be understood. Once again, Daniel's called in to interpret, as he always is. And only he can read the writing. Some of you, if you're viewing uh, the slides, are seeing the painting of a Dutch, a Dutch painter named Rembrandt. Scene painted in 1635 when Rembrandt was just coming into his own. It's labeled Belshazzar's Feast. You can even see a concubine spilling wine from one of the goblins. Rembrandt knew a rabbi who had a theory about why it was Daniel who could interpret this writing, whereas the wise men of Babylon could not. See, Aramaic usually reads from right to left, but in Rembrandt's painting, the writing comes from top to bottom, and it is as if the hand of God is writing from heaven to earth. What are these words? They're really three very common Aramaic words. It's the name of three of their coins. Mene, Tekel, which we know as Shekel, and Parsa. Right? Those three coins Daniel perceives in them a play on words. Like the English pound, which is both a currency and a wave. In these three coins, maybe even in a sing-song seller's chant, a dime, nickel, penny, two bits, four bits, six bits, a dollar, he hears the pronouncement of judgment. Mene means count, so God has counted and numbered your days. 
Tekel, shekel means to weigh. So you've been weighed in the balance and you're a little light. Parson means to divide. So God is going to divide and split up the kingdom and give it to other people. And Daniel's dealing with Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar had been teachable. Daniel had been able to coach him. Yeah, it took 10 years eating grass somewhere off. But, but Daniel had been able to plant in him a seed that then gave fruit in repentance. He changed. But not Belshazzar. There's a terrible truth about blasphemy. When you begin to mock God, consciously mock God, deliberately live as though God does not exist, then you become immune, immune to encouragement, immune to coaching, immune to the prophet, giving a word of warning. Jesus says all sins are delivered, uh, forgiven except the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. Why is that one so different? Because it calcifies the heart. Sometimes faithful resistance means issuing a call to repentance. And sometimes it simply means reading the writing on the wall. When we lived in Atlanta, and I worked for SBL on the Emory campus, Archbishop Desmond Tutu was a theologian in residence, and I got a chance once to hear him speak. And at that time, he was using in his speeches quite often an echo of Frederick Douglass's phrase. He said, Racism is the ultimate blasphemy. God is not mocked, he says. You can't treat his precious children as they were being treated in apartheid and expect God to set aside and be silent and not intervene and be okay with it. Nene, Nene, Tekel, Parson. These are words of God's righteous anger and judgment. They are serious and consequential and terrifying. But the ultimate blasphemy is not Belshazzar's blasphemy. It's not any of the modern examples that I have given today. The ultimate blasphemy is one that God took on himself willingly. Jesus hauled into court and accused of blasphemy laid himself down and died a criminal's death on the cross. In the fullness of time, God went far beyond this cryptic handwriting on the wall on a blasphemous banquet hall. God comes to us and takes on himself the ultimate blasphemy, took on himself the form of a beloved, misused, battered human being, a human vessel, and brought it to honor, sanctified it, and sanctified us with a death that saves us even from blasphemy and makes us sacred and holy, extends that pardon to everyone who will receive it. Do we, like Daniel, have the courage to lead a life of faithful resistance? Do we, like Daniel, have the courage to read the writing that is on the wall? Amen.
theological declaration of Barman. Uh, and I would suggest that you take your bulletin home with you this evening and read it again. At least for me, this is a new one. Uh, and it bears reading a couple of three times just so you can understand. At least it did for me. You may be smarter than I am, no doubt. At any rate, the various offices in the church do not establish the dominion Charlotte, 
for shame. Judy for Scott, John, Larry, for Ben and Dinah at their loss. Show your love in the lives of all those who suffer. Confirm their faith and cast out their fear. Abide in you, that they may abide in you. Show forth in us and in our world the good news of your saving power and love, so that all may believe and have life in you through Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray always, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. We must sustain our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Scripture asks us, how does God's love abide in anyone who has the world's goods, and yet refuses to help a brother and sister in need? So remembering God's love for us, let us give back some part of what we have received with joy and gratitude.
purposes in the world, giving food to the hungry and hope to the despairing, new life to the dead. Teach us to live each day for you so that future generations will know your goodness and praise your glory. In the name of Christ our Lord.